Hello, I'm Bill Monroe, and welcome to episode 78 of Two Minute Talk Tips. Today's tip comes to us from special guest Hillary Billings. Focus on feeling. My tip comes from a lesson learned during my first ever red carpet interview which was with Ryan Seacrest. So obviously it was incredibly nerve wracking to speak with him as he is the public speaker of all public speakers and the interviewer of interviews. And somehow or other, he seems to have like 42 hour days. 42 hour days. I know he does all these things. He has all these businesses. We don't know how he does it. And yet he was so kind and conversational and very thoughtful with his answers and his time on the carpet with me. And I was so in awe in that moment. I don't even remember what I asked him. So thank goodness that we have it all on tape. But I do remember how he made me feel in the interview, which was at ease and talking with other people that interviewed him. They all had very similar stories of, man, I don't, I was so nervous. I was so intimidated. He was so great, but he just made it so easy. And it's been a takeaway that I've never forgotten for speaking, for interviewing, for interacting with people in life. Regardless of what you talk about, people will remember how you made them feel. And in fact, that will have more impact on them than anything else. Studies show people will forget at least 70% of your content, but they will not forget how you made them feel. So if you're not charged by what you're saying, no one else will be. Make sure you can emote and that whatever feelings you want people to get and have and walk away with are hitting because that's what they're taking away from what you're saying. So even going back to, you know, don't be afraid to go out and do it because it's not even with your message. It's what they take away from it. It's not about you. What are you going to leave them with and what feelings are they going to walk away with? Good luck. Stick around. And after the break, we'll hear more from Hillary Billings. Welcome back. You know, in a previous life, my regular way to kick off the new year was to jump on a plane and head down to Las Vegas to spend a week in the Las Vegas Convention Center working the Toshiba booth for CES. My normal space was in the PC division, but we shared the booth with the TV division and they hired several spokespeople to talk about products with attendees and media. And that's how I met Hillary Billings. In between customers and during breaks, we got to chatting about the industry and of course about speech and debate. It was always awesome to catch up with Hillary about her latest adventures at the show in the years that followed. Hillary's had a fascinating career, and really, she is just getting started. Hillary Billings is a burn survivor turned Miss Nevada United States 2013. She's accomplished in journalism, on-camera hosting, and public speaking. She's contributed hundreds of articles to national outlets, including USA Today, Huffington Post, has been featured on Extra Entertainment Television, and worked for E! News. She's now the face for Norwegian Cruise Line's newest ship for their in-room streaming entertainment and had a co-starring role in the final season of Nashville. Most recently, she's been responsible for creating viral social media content and is about to launch her newest venture, a podcast series focused on self-growth called The Iceberg Effect. She also travels and speaks to universities and corporations about embracing adversity and seeking out everyday adventures. Now, let's meet Hillary. So, Hillary, thank you so much for joining us on Two Minute Talk Tips this week. Oh, I'm so happy to be here, Bill. <laughs> you know, it's it's awesome to reconnect after after meeting at, at various trade shows in, in Vegas over the years. It is. It's great. And I'm, I'm so excited for you and for the series and to be a part of it. It's cool to see the evolution. It has been a lot of fun in, uh, going through this project. But when we talk about projects and going through an evolution of things, your career has gone through quite an evolution of itself everything from travel blogger to newspaper columnist lion tamer beauty queen (laughs) corporate spokesperson on camera host viral video producer and now musician i mean the early part of your career has been just such a continuous series of adventures and most people will be thrilled to to just do one of those but I mean, what's been sort of the through line that's that's taken you along that path? What what's driven you through all these adventures? Well, thank you for 
saying that. I think in the moment when you're going through career iterations, especially so many as I have had so early on, uh, you kind of lose your mind a little bit and you're wondering constantly, what am I doing here? And am I making the right decisions? Um, and it's taken me a while to find that common thread, but my path has always been one of self-discovery that now showcases my love of embracing adversity, experiencing everyday adventures, finding humor in everyday situations, and most importantly, around building community. And if something falls under the umbrella of those core values, I'm usually game to give it a go. I think I was lucky enough to have a lot of trauma and tragedy uh, and challenges in my life early on. So now it's it's really given me this drive and motivation to want to maximize my my time here on earth. And I'm, I'm very aware of my own mortality and that uh, we only have a limited time to do all the things things that we want to do. So if you feel like being a beauty queen, lion tamer blogger, who then goes on to host travel videos, that is a career path you can have. (laughs) I think a lot of folks try to encounter, look at, start doing things and start wondering who am I to do this? And that imposter syndrome sort of gets a hold of them. And and I, I know that can be a real struggle for a lot of folks. Is that something you've had to work through? Oh, of course, with every, every single, endeavor that I've taken on. Um, And I've heard that specifically for women, that that can be a higher rate of not even attempting to start. Like guys on the most part will will go after things if if they think that they've got a 60% chance of doing it. Whereas women are more likely uh, to only engage in something that they feel that they are fully qualified to do. And I've just gotten to this point in my life where if it's something that I'm passionate or interested in, I'm going to investigate and see how it goes. And I I no longer fear failure of not succeeding at something. And I've just gotten to the point where I associate more pain with regret than I would uh, trying something and and having it be a learning experience. And I think it's all how you frame it, right? I think a lot of people are afraid to give something a go and find out that it's not worthwhile. But by putting yourself in that situation, you're not only going to learn something about that environment and, and that specific career field or hobby or what have you, but you're also going to learn something about yourself. And as I've continued to travel more places and continually put myself in uncomfortable situations and find a way to make it comfortable, whether through travel or entering a beauty contest or doing public speaking or talking about these sensitive topics, or you're, you're going to learn things about yourself, which then you can then put in your toolbox and say, okay, I've done this. I know that I can handle this situation. So let's just keep moving forward. And really, then it becomes more of an experiment where you're starting to explore and just push the limits and see, well, actually, how far can I go with this? And then that's when it becomes really fun. You know, when you start treating it as an experiment and a chance to learn stuff about yourself and about the world and about other folks that, you know, you, you sort of start defining, defining failure out of the process. I had a friend of mine, we were discussing a a business opportunity that I've been throwing around and and she was like, why aren't you just pursuing it? And I gave her a list of reasons and she's like, okay, perfectionist. Um, She's like, what if you could look at this in a casual relationship? What does it look like if it was casual? And I think there's something to be said about when we take on new opportunities and we want to initially perform and be great at them. But, and a lot of people are afraid to start because they're afraid of looking like a fool or they're afraid of, of not being on top. And the, the truth of the matter is, is that every successful person that you've ever seen in anything has started at the bottom or started a business in a garage or borrowed money and, and found a way to, to be scrappy and make it work for themselves and, and take the time to gather that knowledge and push through that discomfort. So if you're not willing to experience discomfort, then I would say to you that you're not willing, you're not ready to have success. Um, and really just kind of embracing that challenge of being uncomfortable. Um, that whole challenge of being afraid to get started. I think we, we encounter that a lot. Uh, you know, I, I find when I'm talking to other podcasters, one of the key lessons new folks have to learn is that done is better than perfect and just hundred percent go out and do it. So, yes. so how has public speaking played a part in your story? Oh my gosh. 
it's it's played a very large role in my story, even starting back where I was in uh, the National Forensics League, NFL, in high school, uh, speech and debate for those that aren't familiar with the more technical terms. And, and that really framed me. I've always, I've never been afraid to be in front of a crowd uh, and be able to speak to others, but that opportunity, that education really allowed me to learn how to frame an argument and the rules of, of speaking and argumentation and how you can leverage that. And it's really helped to propel my career forward so much as then getting into college and, and becoming more of a motivational speaker and being a leader and and when you're running organizations and, and giving presentations for uh, research that you're doing or what have you, or you're, you're pitching for grant money, and then rolling that into down the way after I was a, a travel blogger and a writer uh, doing on-camera hosting. And public speaking, obviously, is a big part of being on camera and learning how to handle that relationship and what you need to get across in a short amount of time. And then as I started doing celebrity interviews, learning how to emote the responses that I needed from others uh, based upon the questions and how I framed it or, or how I framed the the topic that we were discussing. And a lot of that is based around the environment that you give them. So I would say that public speaking, and especially over the iterations of all my careers, is probably the one thing that's been most consistent in not only the, the skill set that I excel in, but the skill set that's called upon in one form or another in order to, to keep building my employment history and my business. The experience of, of being involved in forensics and speech and debate is yeah. such an incredibly powerful one. I did it in high school. I, 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 I paid for college doing that. And, yeah. you know, I mean, I mean, one of the things I found most valuable in it was it really taught me early on how to do the basics of separating uh, of depersonalizing conflict, recognizing when somebody was talking about me versus my arguments and being able to go ahead and uh, and address that without having my identity questioned in every type of conflict with folks. And it's funny that you bring that up because I continue to keep in touch with many of the people that I was involved in forensics. And, you know, when you and I met years ago, it was a topic that you and I discussed. And I have heard more often than not that of all the things that people have gone through with their educations and their backgrounds and, and whatever degree they got, that the basis for speech and debate and forensics really framed them to not only be successful in college, but also in life. And I think there's something to be said about knowing how to write an argument, knowing how to write an original oratory and how to frame that in such a way that's moving to people. And just like what you said, oftentimes, and we see it now in our very politically polarized climate, especially on social media, people are using false argumentation to try to make points. And it ends up being this cyclical battle that people get stuck in because they're using red herrings or they're using ad hominem attacks and, and they're not really basing it around the problem. They're basing it around the person and making it personal. And then we have this, this conflict that just keeps getting exponentially more frustrating for everyone without a solution because we've stopped looking at the problem as something that we all can work on together. So I, I think even in the span of when we look at our, our social impact and where we're going in our political climate, it's something that's very helpful to have as a coping skill to be able to effectively get what you want over a vast array of topics. I, I, I like that. I hadn't actually thought about it in terms of as a coping skill, but in many respects, that's exactly what it is. So there's a great book called Never Split the Difference, Negotiating as if Your Life Depended on It, that was written by Chris Foss, and he is a former FBI hostage negotiator. And he talks about specifically just what you said, that by addressing the problem and not the person, you will actually get what you want. But all too often when we're negotiating, people are so emotionally charged that they start attacking the person that they're across the table from versus actually remembering that we're here to solve a problem and the person on the other end of the table just has a different perspective of that problem than you do. So don't let that stop you from getting what you want and ensuring that your emotions stay in check, which I think that in general, the Forensics League is very great at teaching you how to do that. So totally agree with you 100%. Fantastic. You know, that actually, um, actually, I think I already have that book on my shelf in my to be read pile. I, I suppose I should move it up to the top of the pile. 
I recommend yeah. it. It's it's pretty impressive. There's a it's a great negotiation book uh, that was based around these skills of when you're negotiating. It's all about the problem, and instead of and people usually get incensed with their own emotions, and then that ends up ruining their ability to actually negotiate. But yeah, it's all really being able to help. So was forensics how you got into speaking or was this already a a passion of yours before you even encountered an opportunity to really, really start exploring that? I was scouted in a class presentation by the president of our speech and debate team at my high school. And so I, I knew that it was something that I was good at, but it wasn't something that I really had a passion to do in my off hours. And when she presented with me this opportunity to be a part of it, it was great to be a part of the community, but essentially, as you know, it's, you give yourself more homework. <laughs> and I had to go back and forth of like, man, do I really want to be doing this? And and then realizing and, and seeing the long-term effects was, was so great. And also having the knowledge base to be able to talk coherently and intelligently about some of the biggest issues that we're facing my generation or the current events of our time. And that was really cool and, and seeing how effective that could be. But what, at the time when I was in speech and debate, I really had no idea as to how much that would serve me moving forward and how effective I would become in it. I mean, I thought that I was going to go on and get my degree to become a lawyer or be a doctor. And then when I got to college, I thought that I was going to be an entertainment lawyer. And then that changed to wanting to be in politics, which then changed to me being in psychology. And by the time I graduated, I thought I was on this path to get my PhD in clinical psych and I wanted to help people and do therapy and maybe be a professor. So obviously I love the idea of being up in front of a classroom and sharing knowledge and, and sharing impact. But when I didn't get into graduate school and my life fell apart and I, and I thought my life was over, I really at the time didn't see where public speaking played any role. And it wasn't until I started writing and, and connecting more with people that that door opened up again. And it was almost like, hey, remember this thing that you used to do and be really good at? There's a way you can you know, add this back into what you're doing now. And that's when things really started rolling for me. Awesome. So it was probably um, shortly after that time that uh, that we met when you were um, working as a spokesperson for Toshiba at CES back in Las Vegas. And it was during my time with Toshiba as well. Uh, how did you get into the trade show business? Well, it's funny because they actually book those gigs mostly for models, right? So at the time, I, I believe I was in college and the, the first year that you and I met mm -hmm. and a, a bunch of girls were brought on to present and essentially be glorified booth babes to stand around product. But as we got into learning about it and I became so passionate and excited about what we were presenting. And I think at the time it was a cell processing chip, which was going to allow people to have 30 different screens on their television at once, which was like the big selling point of the year. And, and I started having these conversations, you know, the, the developers were there from Japan and it quickly became because their English wasn't so great that they would have me explain the product to the media that would come through. And then seeing the value there started getting asked back every year and, and then starting doing a walkthrough of the entire booth to learn all the products and then kind of serving as this liaison, especially for national media outlets and also customers coming through and, and really gaining an understanding very quickly of, of what you guys had spent years working on and, and developing these prototypes. So initially it started off as a modeling gig, but because I had the speaking ability and I'm a quick learner and I'm able to regurgitate information very quickly, it turned into a much bigger opportunity and a, a source of income and a relationship that I carried on for, gosh, I mean, almost 10 years, I would, I would say on and off every year. And, and that's, that's one of the great things about public speaking is that it allows you and affords you these opportunities to, to interact with people in ways that you probably wouldn't initially think. Cause I certainly do not have a background in tech and I know very little about processors or 3d technology or and whatever else, you know, curved screens and what have you, <laughs> but just having the ability to relay that information in a way and, and do it so they get up other people excited about it is is very cool. Absolutely, and you know the trade show business is um, the you know working a booth is an interesting 
experience too. Um, one of the things that happens is that 85% of the questions you get from folks are going to be the same. Pretty much the vast majority yeah. of what you're going to hear in a four or five day trade show, you're going to hear in the first hour of the first day. And then it's about being able to share that and communicate that. The other thing that's that's different here and that that's different in your case is that a lot of uh, folks who who take on that role, a lot of the other uh, the other uh, uh, spokespeople we hired for those events uh, would would do would be fine at doing their job and following their script. When questions came up or new areas came up, and uh, you would need to seek out expertise from the engineers or from the others of us who were full time uh, with the organization would actually, you would actually stay and listen to the answers and ask more follow up <laughs> questions. And that makes a big difference to then go back and communicate that the next time it comes up. It's about taking your the environment and the opportunity you're in to go ahead and learn more and listen more instead of just sort of checking in and and checking out. And that makes a difference, especially in that kind of role. I agree. And I think that unfortunately that maximizing that opportunity gets lost on a lot of the people that are hired to fill that role because for them, they don't see it. They, they didn't interpret the role in the same way that I did. But then what ended up happening as the years went on you know, we started off with maybe 15 or 20 girls that were hired for the first year. The next year we were down to 15. The following year there was 12. And then I was serving as the model manager for them, as well as shooting videos with the Toshiba team as we would go around and, and discuss. And then all that information was going up on Toshiba's website throughout CES. And then it turned into the, the media liaison opportunities and me presenting it to going with the president of Toshiba around and explaining the knowledge that I had acquired from the product lines of that year and what people were hearing about and what was most popular. And again, so th these relationships continue to build and, and grow and all because I was curious and I was dedicated to giving the best possible experience to the people that I was interacting with. And plus, as an intelligent female, it's more fun for me to be able to have longer conversations with people that are in the booth versus hearing the same three questions and just like regurgitating answers back, right? Like it's, we want it to be a dialogue. We want them to be excited. What's the goal to have them be interested in follow up and purchase this product or write about this product, uh, this prototype that's coming in their outlet, whatever that is. And then from that now, I when I do trade shows, I only do uh, keynote speaking opportunities where I'm presenting on stage and I go on stage for five to 10 minutes an hour. It's a really cush job, but it's because I can, again, easily interpret scripts and then relay that information and that excitement to customers. So again, that, that small difference of, of going out and, and listening and, and engaging and asking questions and then providing a better experience for the customer has in turn compounded to a much better speaking experience for me. And, and one of the best ways then to become a better speaker is to spend a lot more time listening to other folks to figure 100%. out how you can develop those tools for later. Yeah, become an expert in the field that they've asked you to become in. And, and you might not have a ton of time and you might not know everything, but you want to make sure that what you're telling people is the appropriate information and that you are as well versed as you can be. And as time went on and I started working as a journalist, you know, the, those skills of, of going out and using your resources just becomes even more important for sure. And that's one of the things that makes that industry so fascinating. Taking a, a sort of different look now at, at what seems to be, from the outside at any rate, a very different industry, how did you get into pageants? And is that something you always wanted to do? No, I've had, I had no interest in pageants. I always thought that pageant girls were dumb and had no life ambitions. And I, if you had told me maybe seven years ago that I was going to be competing in a pageant, I would have laughed in your face. Um, <laughs> I, I had very negative stereotypes and associations for what that looked like and, and was hardcore adamant that it, it objectified women and it oppressed women and it was antiquated and we didn't need it in our society. But I, I happened to be 
It was in 2012. I was travel blogging. I was writing. I was working on a couple movie sets and I ended up working with this, this girl back to back on, on two movie sets over two days in Vegas. And we were sitting around getting to know each other and she was funny. She was intelligent. She was bright and motivated and driven. And she was a former beauty queen. And, and so the, the stereotype started to break down immediately. And she was very adamant that I should compete. And I just kept saying, no, I'm, I'm smart and I have life ambitions and <laughs> there's things that I want to be doing. And I, I left her and I ended up going to Fiji and living with the Firewalkers for a month and was writing about that. And I came back from that experience around the 4th of July. And I ended up at a friend's barbecue where a firework malfunctioned and I ended up being hit with this malfunctioning firework and suffered second and third degree burns to my chest and my stomach. And doctors didn't know what my healing time would look like. They didn't know if I'd look normal. We didn't know. I, I, I had no idea the scope of what that effect would have on my life in the future. I knew I had to cancel all my surf trips for the fall that I had planned and, you know, talk about feeling like an imposter. I spent the next six months hiding out in Vegas, healing and writing about traveling and feeling like I was a nobody. And except for the people that were directly in my sphere of proximity in Vegas, no one knew what was going on. And it wasn't until right around New Year's Eve, I was hired as a model for some event and I put on a dress and I turned around and looked at myself in the mirror and I just started crying and I had enough. I was tired of putting myself in this pity party and on my blog, I specifically talked about putting yourself in uncomfortable situations and finding a way to make them comfortable, particularly related to travel. But I needed to do something like that for myself now, and I knew it. And nothing sounded more uncomfortable than being on stage in a bikini and having someone judge me based upon my, my appearance. So I entered as a way of overcoming my self-confidence issues and, and really just to get a blog out of it. That was the goal. And I... It's amazing what we'll do just to get a good story or a good episode a or a good, good blog story. post. Yeah. And honestly, I, I hated and dreaded the entire experience. I had nightmares leading up to it of me coming out on stage naked and tripping and falling. And, and it wasn't until I actually met the girls the week of the pageant that I really started to understand the impact that pageantry has on their community. And these girls that were competing were very bright and very motivated. There was one that had previously been homeless. And so she was advocating for homeless populations. Another's brother had been addicted to drugs. She was fighting for drug opioid awareness and, and getting people away from drug addiction and, and all these different organizations and these platforms that women were advocating for because of their life experiences and recognizing that in some weird way, pageants still provided a microphone for women and an opportunity for them to share what was important to them and give back to their community. So I went and I, and I competed and I had no idea that I was going to win. And I thought it was a mistake when they announced my name, but it became an incredible opportunity that I was so grateful and didn't even know that I needed in my life, which is why I'm a big advocate for just going and trying things because you don't know what's going to, what's going to stick and what's going to become part of your identity and what's going to build you up. But I was able to work with the burn foundation throughout my year and the burn Institute and camp beyond the scars, which is a summer camp for children that are burn survivors out of San Diego and, and be a spokesperson and an advocate for them and the firefighters of the Nevada. And, and through all this, I, you know, I competed in nationals uh, a year to the date that I was burned on, in the swimsuit preliminaries. And shortly thereafter, my blog won some local blogging awards from these prestigious magazines in, in Vegas. And then shortly after that, USA Today called and asked if I'd be willing to be their local Las Vegas insider. And then I worked with USA Today for the following three years and contributed hundreds of articles and started doing on-camera hosting for them from there. So it, it really was a, a great jumping off platform for me to be able to, to start executing on these other things in my life that I didn't even know that I needed to do. Well, that's awesome how, um, you know, for, for many folks, you know, winning the, 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 the role of, of Miss Nevada would be, the, you know, the top accomplishment. And in your case, it was really just the start of an entirely new chapter. Absolutely. And, you know, I'm so grateful that I got to be Miss Nevada United States 2013. And I really loved when I was giving up my title. And obviously by that point I was exhausted. My, my sash was ratty and gross. <laughs> I'd done so many appearances in 
there's so much makeup and tanner. But I was grateful to see the diversity of the girls that were competing in the following year. We tripled our numbers that year. And we had women that were publicists and educators and lawyers and small business owners that were competing. And I loved that because it just went on to show that through being a role model and, and executing this experience, we had women from all backgrounds that were suddenly interested and, and could see how you can leverage this for a business opportunity. And I think that when I see, when I look at now what's happening with pageantry and clearly it's going through a major marketing and, and PR issue with what's going on with the different systems and all the changes that everyone's trying to make to, to find a way to keep pageantry relevant. A lot of the girls just aren't receiving the guidance or don't understand that Every moment within your year is a chance to leverage for a future opportunity, and it should be looked at as such. Uh, and unfortunately, I think a lot of girls think of the title as of having made it, but it's it's really just the microphone that you get to manifest whatever it is that you're here to do. And so I'm grateful as I'm continuing to build this network of women that we get to empower each other and share that message because it's so important. And there's other organizations and ways that you can do this, but my, my biggest piece of advice that I can give to anyone is, is find that community and find that organization that's going to help you grow what you want to do and that message that you want to spread. And there's so many ways and so many community network organizations that you can utilize to do just that. But know that everything is a stepping stone. Awesome. So, so what do you think about that field would most surprise folks? About pageantry? Yes. I think it would be how intelligent these women are and how accomplished they are. Because when you think about it, for a woman to go up on stage in front of national cameras and be ready to answer questions on a number, any topic under the sun, but it, usually it's it's highly politicized, right? right. And, and based around current events and to have the know-how or confidence, one, to have the gumption to go up and do something like that in front of millions, most of which that are watching kind of hoping you're going to fail, right? <laughs> because people, the most often shared are, are the videos of the girls who totally bomb those onstage questions. So you are spending weeks, if not months ahead ahead of time, preparing, watching the news multiple times a day, getting mutual opinions, forming arguments for both sides because you don't know what the question's going to be. And also wanting to make sure that your answers don't isolate a population. It's kind of like being a politician in that way where you represent a, a brand and you are responsible for ensuring that whatever your political views are, that you can empower and encourage others to take action without it causing ramifications for you or your brand or for the business that you are employed by as the title holder, right? And then you're also spending all this time working on your body and, and getting that confidence up and on these walks and doing all these appearances. So to have the endurance to be able to do all that, you have to be highly driven by your why. And then to be able to ingest all this information and all the stimuli that's coming at you and all these people that want things from you and be able to stay balanced in your mission and then be able to go out and execute on stage and then to wrap that up because only one of 51 girls is going to win and the other 50 then continue on and have to take that, that failure and I put that in air quotes because I don't think it's a failure. One in 51 girls is going to win. And then the rest of us go back and we have to execute the rest of our years to the best of our ability. You cannot be a weak woman and do that. It's just it's not possible. It's too much. It's too much stress. It's too much energy. You have to really want to make a difference and an impact in your community in order to execute on that and be willing to take the fail if you fall on stage or you flub a word or you don't answer the question properly or someone gets a You have to be willing to take that risk because your why is stronger. So I would say that the fact that most people think that pageant girls are dumb is the biggest misnomer. And, and you said something there that was especially interesting um, twice, actually. You mentioned finding your why and talking about your why. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that idea? Absolutely. I, it's, kind of, it's kind of a Tony Robbins mantra and theory, which is that you are more likely to succeed at something if you are set and anchored in why you're doing something. So oftentimes when we get involved with activities or hobbies, or we'll, we'll have a, a brief moment of motivation, right? Where it's like, I want to lose 
10 pounds or I'm going to quit smoking or I'm going to go back to school. I'm going to finish that book, whatever it, I'm going to go talk to that guy and ask him out. I'm going to, whatever it may be. And when we're motivated, that's great. And we will be taking action. And that motivation might last for a day. It might last for a week. It might last for a month. And we might not even get that far. I might have that thought and be like, yeah, this sounds awesome. We'll start tomorrow. And then tomorrow becomes the next day. And then tomorrow becomes the next day. And tomorrow is just a place where your goals hang out that you never actually end up. We never get there, right? So in order for you to actually start and take action, you have to have leverage on yourself and you have to know why you want to do this. Are you quitting smoking because you have lung cancer or because you want to be at your daughter's wedding when she's older? Do you, are you losing that 15 pounds because you don't want to have diabetes and you want to be healthier? And, and again, you want to be at your daughter's wedding in, in a few years. Are you going to go up and talk to that guy? Cause you need to get over your fear of rejection or, you know, he might be the one you never know. I, I, I think that so often we start before we stop because we don't really know why we're doing things. And it's more of just a way to distract ourselves and not really addressing the root of the problem. So if we, if we're very clear on why we're taking certain actions and you and I touched on this before we started recording, you know, with your other podcast series and and why that's important to you and your life experience that is anchored in that, which is why you're putting the time and effort into helping others now. And even with this series, there's, there are strong whys as to why you are willing to be with me on this Friday afternoon, taking the time to do this. When and it's be not just because you're now. delightful. Thank you. <laughs> I, I appreciate that being a factor. But yes, <laughs> because you, you have a mission that's greater than, you know, just having a sub sandwich in the afternoon and watching Netflix. And while one is easier this one drives you in a way. And so again, I encourage anyone when they're looking to do anything, public speaking, you know, making a keynote, going after a job, any action, like what is, what is the driving factor behind this? And if you know that and you can give it words, then it has more weight and you're actually going to be able to leverage that into action. And, and that really ties into one of the other really core challenges that many people have with public speaking. And that's the the nerves and the anxiety that often yeah. go along with that. I I often tell folks that the key is it's not about you. It's about your message. It's about what you're trying to accomplish. It's about your goal. Yeah. It, it's it's about your why. Uh, and that makes that that helps push through that barrier uh, that folks just feel petrified about getting up on the stage. What do you generally say to folks who feel that public speaking just makes them too nervous? Well, yeah, I I would first echo your sentiments and that if they know their why and that it's about their message, then it's not about them. And people aren't really there to see me on stage and how pretty I look in whatever dress I've decided to wear that day. They're there because they want to hear what I have to say. And there's something that I'm going to be contributing to their lives that adds value and either gets them to be motivated to do something or take action or allows them to reframe a perspective, which then is going to allow them to take action, right? Everything that we do and we put out there has an end goal. So if you know that end goal, then it becomes less about people. Oh, what do they think of me? And and are my hands doing the right things? And did I say that the right way? And no, like your goal is to communicate this message so they can then intrinsically take that and go do something else. What is that? What are they going to go do? What are you going to tell them? And how is that going to affect their lives. And then it becomes about service, right? Versus about, oh, I need to go up there and do a good job. Like what's that measurable? So again, to echo what you were saying, get clear on that. And then it takes a lot of the pressure off you personally, because it's not about you. Um, And I'd say that when someone's nervous of public speaking, that's a learned response, but they're really not alone, right? Because public speaking is the most shared fear in the world. And curiously enough, I think that's partly to how it's portrayed as we grow up. We aren't really given an opportunity to do a lot of it in school and get used to vocalizing our thoughts or quickly pivot, which is another reason why I'm a big advocate for the National Forensics League. And while I've never had a fear of public speaking myself, I've had many fears that I've just learned that I have to jump into and get over. And oftentimes we build up things to be such monsters when simple acts will help us squash the fear, like kill the monster while it's little. And I'm a big 
fan of proving to myself that even if something may not go the way that I thought it would, that I didn't die or wither away in the process, right? So therefore I can keep going. And I encourage anyone who wants to speak to just get out there and start practicing. Show your fear response that you won't die in the process. And everything up until now has shown you that you've lived through it. And I had to do this with interviewing high profile celebrities. I had to do this while preparing for red carpets and having no idea what I was doing. You know, when, when USA Today first asked me to cover the iHeartRadio Music Festival and interview celebrities, and we had no idea who was going to be there. And I had never done this before. I said, yeah, sure, that sounds great. Happy to do it. Not a problem. And then I freaked out for three days. And it wasn't <laughs> until I was on the carpet and we just got going that it's like, okay, I, I'm fine. No one screamed at me. I haven't upset anyone yet. And of course, like there were times where that did happen, but I still lived through it. You think it's easy to walk into a room and like, be the only reporter who is like five minutes with Ringo Starr? It's terrifying, but you do it anyway and you live through the experience. And honestly, because you have such a low expectation of it, it's probably going to be so much better than you ever could have imagined. And then you get to use that as a hallmark for the next thing that you go into to say, well, I thought this was a big deal and I lived through that. And in fact, it turned out to be awesome. So maybe I can start framing this and be excited instead of nervous, right? And because it's the same, the same kind of responder is just perceptions different. Just go do it. Just go do it. <laughs> just go do it. That, that go is- do it. That is, that is the mantra. That's, that's what it takes. Go, <laughs> go do it. You'll come through it and, and you'll be better for it. Exactly. Exactly. So if folks want to know more about you and what you're up to, where should they go? All the social medias. I'm very active on Instagram and Facebook. So on my Facebook page is Hillary Billings, H-I-L-A-R-Y, Billings, B-I-L-L-I-N-G-S, my official fan page. Come on over, send me a message, interact with my content. You can find me. My Instagram handle is at Hillary, H-I-L-A-R-Y underscore Billings, B-I-L-L-I-N-G-S. I'm also about to kick off a podcast series called The Iceberg Effect. So keep a lookout for that on iTunes. And I look forward to hearing from you awesome and we will have all of those links over in the show notes at two minute talk tips.com slash hillary as well yay <laughs> hillary this has been absolutely fantastic thank you so much for joining us this week oh my gosh thank you for having me bill and i look forward to hearing from all of your listeners i always enjoy chatting with hillary she's passionate intelligent and committed to do the work it takes to reach her goals and I really appreciate how she identified her four core values right up front. Embrace adversity, experience everyday adventures, find humor in everyday situations, and build community. So what does this conversation make you think about? Let us know in the comments over at 2minutetalktips.com slash Hillary. You can connect with Hillary on Facebook or Instagram. You'll find those links over at 2minutetalktips.com slash Hillary. Do you know anyone who might be interested in this conversation? Go ahead and send them the link to, you guessed it, 2minutetalktips.com slash Hillary. Be on the lookout for The Iceberg Effect, Hillary's new podcast. Focus on how you can make your audience feel in your next talk. And of course, as always, don't get best. Get better. Thanks a lot. I'm Bill Monroe, and I'll talk to you next week. Two Minute Talk Tips is a proud production of the Currently Speaking Podcast Network. Thank you.